just be certain that I'll be true. Take my five dollars, take my shirts and collars, take my heart that hollers, 'cause everything I've got belongs to you. Two lips that care for mating, therefore waiting will not do. Take my five dollars, take my coats and collars, take my heart that hollers, 'cause everything I got. The tables are empty. The dance floor's deserted. You play the same love song. It's the tenth time you've heard it. I'm calling to order the regular uh, school board meeting, Carpenter Unified School District, for January 24th, 2023. May everybody please stand for the flag salute. Okay, uh, we had a closed session, a uh, conference with labor negotiators. Information was exchanged, no action taken. Um, we're going to move on to C3, approval of the minutes. May I get a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Can I get a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, public comment. Employee Union President Jay Hulcher. Correct. Just push it and you will see the green light. There you go. Yes, thank you. All right, Happy New Year. Uh, on January 10th, 2023, the superintendent referenced the January 9th, 2023 weather event, choosing to focus on the camaraderie of district employees instead of the performance and decisions of district leadership, both during and immediately following the weather event and closures. Uh, what she missed in her analysis, uh, and members of the school board may have also missed, is this. As the morning of the weather event progressed, teachers, support staff, district families, and the union, union leaders, were seeking clarification on how to respond to the mounting evacuations and extreme weather impacting our region and our community. More specifically, employee representatives respectfully sought the district's leadership during the January 9th extreme weather event. In doing so, the union did not announce that schools were closed. Rather, we received an update from county officials that stated, quote, all schools have been dismissed. This was provided to district employees and district leadership without any interpretation. Beyond forwarding the announcement from county officials, the only statement we included was this. Please see email below. We are waiting for an announcement from the CUSD as to how they will proceed. Take care. It is clear that the superintendent had every opportunity to respond and lead at that time. 
but she didn't. The superintendent had every opportunity to empower school site leadership to support and lead as well, but she didn't, so they didn't either. Instead, she chose to quietly keep schools open while all other districts around us began dismissing students as safely as possible and taking uh, the regional evacuation order seriously. The decision to keep schools open as if it were just any other school day, while also failing to communicate in any comprehensive manner to the district personnel involved, exposed students and employees to unnecessary dangers, and specifically, placed district employees and their families in harm's way. Now, hindsight is 2020, so the quality of her decision may be debatable. But instead of examining the superintendent's performance that day, it seems that the, that the district leadership is determined to gloss over this with talk of camaraderie, while simultaneously, some of you, blaming the union for the dysfunction that district leadership owns. A routine approach for this district leadership team. On January 9th, 2023, district leadership's silence and lack of concern for district employees and families was palpable, just as it was in the following 24 hours, when districts, when districts closed school when district schools were closed but on the day of the school closures the district still held a 15-minute board meeting where the superintendent received a three-year contract extension extension a three percent raise thank you thank you and a plot of the school board's performance thank you do we have any further public comment on the minutes no, no? okay uh all in favor aye aye aye, aye. aye. Okay, uh, approval of agenda and consent agenda. Uh, to approve the agenda and the consent agenda. I'll second. Okay, um, I'd like to just make a comment. Um, the field trip, I just want to make a comment. The field trip um, requests that are typically in the consent agenda are a formality. Um, they've already gone through whatever vetting process needs to be done. Um, and once they're on here, th for the most part, I, I, I haven't seen in the years that I've participated at school board meetings a field trip get pulled or canceled other that for something other than logistics, weather, things like that. Um, and I think it's... Uh, I don't know if it only happened in several school board members kids classes or if it happened in mul multiple classes without school board members kids but the fear mongering that occurred in the last couple of weeks over field trips i feel was wildly inappropriate um and for for to have children coming up to our parents and saying well i don't know if the school board's going to approve these field trips it's up to the school board kids aren't going to come up with that on their own and they said that this came from the teachers. And I am, um, I'm actually, I'm shaking. I'm really upset. And I, I, I am going to speak with the people directly that I am affected by this with. But um, I just want to say across the board, I am so sorry to the parents whose kids are coming home and saying, I don't know if we're going to get to go to the zoo. I don't know if we're going to get to go to the islands. Um, because it depends on this. And, and I'm so sorry if your kids have, have had that happen to them. And I encourage you to please let um, your school site know if that did. So with that, I'd like a roll call for the consent agenda, please. Aye. Aye. Here. Aaron. Aye. Sally. Aye. Jamie. Aye. I'm I. Uh, uh, comment on, I apologize. Comment on the agenda and consent agenda. Union President Jay Hotcher. We have no comment again until E public interest reports and presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Public interest reports and presentations. A recognition to Canalino teacher Sonia Aguila on being named the Teacher of the Year for the National Association of Bilingual Education. Um, I believe Diana has a presentation. Congratulations. So we have a very special person with us tonight, a very special educator, Sonia Aguilar, DLI teacher at Canalino, who is not only 
our teacher in our school who's fabulous. She's the California Teacher of the Year, Bilingual Teacher of the Year, and now she is the National Bilingual Teacher of the Year. Please join me in thank you. Hi, good evening. Isn't this exciting? Carpenter Unified School Director District is on the map from Sonia Aguila. So earlier this school year um, in our district, Canalino second grade dual language immersion teacher Sonia Aguila was selected as the teacher of the year for the California Association of Bilingual Educators. This was a huge award that recognized Sonia's incredible talents as an advocate for bilingual students, their families, and as an outstanding instructor for her students for 25 years at Canalino School. Now, Sonia has been chosen as the Teacher of the Year for the National Association of Bilingual Edu Educators um, called NABE. So NABE's mission is to advocate for educational equity and excellence for bilingual, multilingual students in a global society. NABE is the only national professional organization devoted rep to representing bilingual and multilingual students and bilingual and dual language um, um, education uh, professionals. So it has 20 state and regional affiliates and four international affiliates, which collectively re represents more than 5,000 members. These members include bilingual and English learner teachers, parents, paraprofessionals, administrators, professors, advocates, researchers, and policymakers. NABE places high value on the academic, linguistic, and cultural development of a child's native language, which is what we are doing here in uh, Carpenter Unified School District at Aliso and Canalino with the Dual Language Immersion Program. NABE is highly committed to prepare 21st century multiliterate global citizens who will make contributions in economic, civic, technological, and cultural advancement. We embrace this mantra and adv advocate learning more than two languages and cultures. NABE members are the ambassadors who choose to create unity within the diverse and interdependent world, and Sonia will be representing all bilingual educators across the country when she attends the annual NABE conference February 21st to the 23rd in Portland, Oregon. There are some other engagements she's going to be doing as well um, for the rest of this school year. So Carpenter Unified School District, its staff, students, and families are so proud of Sonia's amazing accomplishments. She has been an outstanding leader, especially in the inception of the dual language immersion program in CUSD, serving on the leadership team from the very start, writing the plan maestro for our program. Sonia also um, often facilitates ELAC meetings at the site and district level supports culturally relevant instruction and events for students and families, and for many years hosts a radio show in Santa Barbara, helping parents in how to best to support their students. We are all extremely proud that Sonia Aguila, Teacher of the Year for the National Association of Bilingual Educators, serves our students in Carpinteria. <laughs> It is such a blessing to wake up every morning and do what I love. I knew since I was five that I wanted to be a teacher. This is my 25th year, but I started young. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you that know me know that it wasn't easy. I learned English in high school, and I used to cry because I didn't understand what my professors were saying, but I never gave up. And so this award means so much to me. Um, I am proud to be bilingual. I am very proud of our DLI program, and I'm very excited that people all over the U.S. will now look at Canalino, will look at Carpinteria, and our DLI program. So thank you so much. So, so blessed. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sonia, I'd, I'd just like to say, I mean, congratulations. We're so proud of you. But I remember when we were debating whether or not to start the DLI program, and the, the, there was some opposition to it and, and, the, and the idea that it was a risky venture. 
And and the thing that always stu stuck with me was that I, knew, I had experience watching you in the classroom and I knew that with a teacher like you, it was not gonna be a risky venture. And, and, and you've proved us so right in that and I'm so happy that that program is being successful and, and in large part to what, what you've been able to do. So, so you know, congratulations. I'm, I know your family's so proud of you. Yeah, it's great to see them. Thank you. I want to say too that um, having worked with Sonia for more than 20 years, uh, when she was a very young teacher, uh, I could see back then that she was going to change lives and not only change the lives of children, but she was going to change the lives of the families that that you worked with. Um, it was a pleasure to walk in your classroom because you always knew what every child needed and did your very best to take care of each individual child and they all succeeded. So thank you, Sonia, for all your time. Thank you. Um, Sonia, I just want to say thank you again. Um, I am in awe of all that you've done and you're a mom and a, a, a partner and a friend and a sister and so many things to so many people, but the drive you have knowing what you're doing is true and right and good and, and, and helping so many along the way with it, um, it's inspiring for sure. And I'm just so grateful that you did what you did because now, at least third time around, I get a kid that gets to go through the DLI program finally. <laughs> but um, I just, every time I would see like your name coming up with stuff, I just was so excited for you and just congratulations. So thank you. Do we have public comment? Union President Jay Hotchner. Wonderful. All righty, well first, uh, union leadership wants to express its appreciation and its pride um, as we recognize the extraordinary, ser the extraordinary service and accomplishments that you've had, Ms. Aguila, really impressive. Um, she remains a mentor to her colleagues, to her supervisors, to her students, to the board, obviously, and uh, the family she serves, and thank you. Uh, there could not be enough applause for Sonia. Second, um, as a union president, I'm compelled to share the extraordinary professionalism of Ms. Aguila uh, that she's demonstrating at this very moment, at this event, at this time. Uh, when the union learned of the district's recognition, uh, union leadership asked Ms. Aguila to please use her professional reputation, her expertise, and her powerful experience to educate the school board and the community on how to better build a bilingual education program and better serve the predominantly bilingual community that we do serve. Uh, we asked Ms. Aguila to consider her recognition as an opportunity to take a polite stand on the topic of employee compensation uh, values in regard to those who provide such expertise to the district, um, especially those who provide bilingual services to our district families and students. We suggested that she could clarify the need for increased bilingualism across the district in both the DLI program and in routine communications with districts and parent, district parents and families. We hope she might clarify the compensation discrepancies in the CUSD when compared to other districts that, uh, that pay for, um, at a much healthier rate, the bilingual talents that people, employees, bring to the district. Uh, we thought she might speak to the challenges uh, CUSD has when trying to recruit and hire bilingual employees. Uh, and we asked that she clarify the impact on our students and families, particularly in absence of devoting such resources to the robust bilingual needs of the district students and families. But Sonia is simply too humble to provide such a genuine authoritative statement uh, to her supervisors, to the board, and to the superintendent. And union leadership understands, and we can appreciate that about Ms. Aguila. Uh, but we didn't want to miss the opportunity to make the point that administrators' recognition and cheering for the excellence Ms. Aguila demonstrates as an individual teacher each and every day is far different than, the administ than administrators investing in systems that assure that that same excellence is available to future students. The excellence that Ms. Aguila brings to her students, again, each and every day. So thank you again, Sonia. You really are a gift to us all. Thank you. A 
Again, thank you so much, Sonia. I really appreciate it. And, um, and I think it goes without saying that the conversation we had several months ago um, had an impact. And I know that we are proud to have already put out there that we have offered an increase in the PCLAD. So thank you. OK. Um, next. Uh, it looks like we do not have a student representative report for tonight. Uh, no, I was informed she was coming. Probably something okay. got on the way. OK, so we're striking that. Uh, superintendent's report. Thank you. So I'd like to begin with some appreciation, and I'd like to recognize our IT team, Aaron LaPlante and John McClure, for their outstanding professional work in resolving all of our network, internet, and computer issues with speed and accuracy. The next item is our first semester middle school and high school student performance. 66% of the middle school students earned a 3.0 or higher GPA with a school average GPA of 3.19. And 67% of our high school students earned a 3.0 or higher GPA with a school average of 3.32 GPA. We also, I also um, provided you with comparisons from last year to this year's grades and um, the good news is our high school students are doing better than last year. Our middle school students, our sixth graders are still struggling. And so we continue to offer tutoring at the middle school with students with D's and F's. And the good news is it's our own teachers providing the tutoring after school. The challenge is that um, we need to work harder with the parents to gain their support in requiring their students to participate in that after school tutoring. I've also shared with you our elementary um, first semester uh, star reading assessment. And our goal is that 60% of our third graders will uh, meet the grade level standards. We're working hard towards that with increased after school tutoring as well as continuing with our reading intervention. We are also involved in professional development. The Santa Barbara County Office of Ed is providing professional development for the high school math department and elementary teachers to strengthen their work on their professional learning communities to improve student learning. The PLCs collectively analyze student performance data to evaluate student learning and needs and to determine the improvement in the instructional strategies. Teachers talk about their instructional practices, share knowledge, and observe one another for continuous adult learning and improvement. The next item is our school accountability report cards. Every school in California is required by state law to publish a school accountability report card by February 1st. We call it the SARC, and it contains information about the condition and performance of each California public school. Additionally, all local schools are required to prepare the LCAP, which describes how they intend to meet the annual specific school-specific goals for all students with specific activities to address state and local priorities. The data that we reported in the LCAP last uh, spring is also consistent with the school accountability report card data. And all of our report cards are posted on our website. The next item is the state budget proposal by Governor Newsom. He released the state budget on January 10th, and then revenue forecast has declined since the 2022 State Budget Act, and the estimated budget gap is $422.5 billion. The proposed budget includes Proposition 98 funding of $108.8 billion for 23-24, which is $1.5 billion lower compared to the level when the 22 Budget Act was enacted. The proposed budget also includes the following. 8.13% COLA for LCFF districts. And a reminder is that we are not LCFF or a basic aid district. Uh, 690 million to implement the second year of TK for students turning five years old between September 2nd and April 2nd. 8.13% COLA applied to special ed. A delay of the 23-24 Plan Facilities Grant Program for preschool TK and K. $941 million to fund Proposition 28 Arts and Music in Schools with um, the reduction in the Arts, Music, and Instructional Materials Block Grant. And $250 million one-time funding for literacy coaches and reading specialists. More detailed information is going to be needed before Maureen and I can determine the impact on our particular CUSD budget. 
And the last item is related to Measure U. Uh, again, we're pleased to announce the opening ceremony for our beautiful new Summerlin is planned for Saturday, the 28th at 2 p.m. So please join us for a celebration and a tour of our beautiful new elementary school, which is the first elementary school to be rebuilt in two decades in Southern Santa Barbara County. Okay. Do any board members have any comments or questions for the superintendent's report? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a quick question on the uh, star rating assessments for elementary. Um, does that, on the averages, um, and you may not know this, and I apologize for not asking this yeah, sure. so you could be prepared earlier, but um, for the, the, the third, fourth, and fifth, um, with the DLI, is there any, at Kim, you know, was there any impact on like the third grade where they're kind of switching between um, in, uh, Spanish into English, the star reading assessment, if they're more heavier on the Spanish at that point in the DLI program, is the star reading assessment done in Spanish or is it done in English? Like how would, would you mind? Well, I have Jamie explain. right here. She's going to explain exactly how it works. Oh, fabulous. Thank I just want just logistically yeah. how that yeah, works. But Jamie will explain. If yes, that makes so sense. If yeah. I, I'm able to yeah. express, was that how? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, all dual language immersion classrooms, um, well, they start in kindergarten and first grade and they do only the star reading in Spanish. And then starting in second grade, Correct. Yeah. In second grade, they, they do both. Um, they do the star um, one month in English, and then this next, well, we were doing it two at a time, and um, the teachers and I agree, f have felt that's too many assessments. So now we alternate months on the Spanish and English. And so I do, we just reported the English numbers, um, but we do have um, numbers for, for the uh, Spanish all the way through fifth grade. And generally, um, especially last year, I did a really detailed um, d dive on that. The DLI classes are almost a year ahead of um, English only classes in their reading levels. Thank you. I just was wondering how that worked into all yes. of that. How and the star math together. is the same. We also do star math okay. in, in uh, Spanish as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Thanks, Jamie. Um, do we have public comment on the superintendent's report? Union President Jay Hoster. Pardon me. You Thank you. Uh, the superintendent's comments uh, the, are on the current state budget proposal uh, were insightful. Uh, perhaps in some ways more in regard to what they left out than what she chose to include. Um, union leadership would like to reinforce some of the details uh, shared by Ms. Rigby and provide others that weren't included. Uh, first, Governor Newsom released his initial state budget proposal for the 2023-24 school year, um, uh, which is an act that kicks off budget hearings and negotiations that will take place over the next few months. It is correct that the state is facing a deficit and lower revenues than expected, but even with this scenario, under the governor's proposal, much of the education funding will be increased by statutory COLAs estimated at just above 8%. Second, and in regard to the overall fiscal conditions impacting those conversations, California is on track to have lower revenues this year and last year than had been anticipated when the 22-23 budget was signed. This translates to a budget gap of about $22.5 billion for the 23-24 budget to address. The governor's proposal includes a variety of mechanisms, but no substantial cuts are proposed for education. Proposition 98 estimates are updated each year during the process, and the January estimates show a three-year total overall decrease of $4.7 billion in the minimum guarantee. With these revised numbers, the minimum guarantee for Prop 98 in 23-24 is estimated to still be a increase over the revised 22-23 amounts. Importantly, these changes would still result in a record K-12 per pupil funding amount. Even basic aid districts like ourselves benefit from this condition. 
The statutory COLA is projected to be 8.13, and the budget proposal applies this COLA broadly, not only to LCFF funding, but also to special education and many other categorical programs. Finally, the proposal does not rely on any withdrawals from the Prop 98 Rainy Day Fund. Thank you. Any further public comment? No? Okay. Um, I am excited to have Carpenter Middle School's uh, ASB come on up and give a presentation. So please introduce yourself, name, grade. I'm Molly Diamond, and I am in seventh grade. My name is Natalia Andrade, and I'm in eighth grade. In August, we elected our school officers, organized a babysitting room for back to school night. We interviewed teachers. We held a musical chairs game during lunch. In September, we started our monthly newspaper called the CMS Post. We held our back to school night, our back to school spirit week. We approved school clubs, provided lunchtime lawn games, worked on the avocado f dioramas for the avocado festival. In October, um, we had our first decor door decorating contest, Mr. Ethington's Door One. Um, we sold candy, sold candy grams. We published the CMS post. We celebrated National Dodgers Day, Unity Day, Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day, and convinced others to celebrate too. We made posters to let people know what events are happening. We planned a Spirit Week around Red Ribbon, Red Ribbon Week. <laughs> we organized and had the whole school pledge to be drug free on red, sh on red strips of paper then turn them into the red, into red chains that were hung in the hall. We had a, door, a donut eating contest at lunch. Finally, we had a Halloween costume contest at lunch. In November, we, we had our canned food drive for the Unity Shop. And we ended up raising, over, raising 10 1,035 cans, and the winning class was Miss Becker's. We put out our third monthly newspaper. ASB did a thankful tree that was put up in the hallway. We also approved the Wellness Club and the Safe Club. We put out a character traits video uh, for responsibility and hard work. In December, in the beginning of December, we printed out the December issue of the CMS Post. We had a after-school hangout on December 9th. We organized a lunchtime activity, the mitten game. We sold candy cane grams. We had a winter door decorating contest. We had an ugly sweater day on 12-16th. On our last day of school, we, before winter break, we, we went to our assigned classrooms to drop off the candy candy games and counted the people wearing ugly sweaters. At the end of all that, we had a class party. Thank you, and that's the end. Wonderful, Stay wonderful. There. Thank you. Stay there. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, so this is the first year of ASB as an elective. Um, Ms. Andrade, correct? Okay, and I believe you are the ASB president, is that correct? Okay, so were you part of ASB last year? Um, at the very end of it, actually. I was really interested by my friends. Okay, and um, would you say uh, having it as an elective is more or less, like what are the, what have you seen um, the difference in it being an elective versus an after school or lunchtime? Um, I think we have more time doing the things we need for our school when it's a class instead of a club. Um, we have uh, we have more like meetings and communications, and we like I don't know. <laughs> we do. Um, 
we we have more time to do a lot of things so we get a lot more done and it's easier for us to communicate with our teachers and um, like doing the door decorating contest we have more time for that and also doing candy cane grams and can other candy grams um, those are it's a lot easier because we have a lot more time to um, assign uh, different teachers to students um, to go do the candy grams and yeah and um, I have really enjoyed the CMS post and I feel like you guys have probably had a lot of fun being able to work on it and is it being received well by the school by the other kids and, and teachers yeah what are the um, reactions we have a fun and game page where we have like word cross and like word search and it's like a lot of fun people in first period during advisory they like do it and they'll come up to me and they'll be like this is so cool and stuff like that so I think they really enjoy it. Are you doing your, your, the CMS post in, in class or is that in Mr. Johnson's class? That's in our class. In class. Who, and who's your advisor? Miss Taylor. And, and Miss Taylor's here, I think. Yes, there she oh, is. Oh, there she is. Hi. <laughs> Didn't see you behind. That's great. Lisa. Well, congratulations. Does anybody else have anything for the ASB team? Well, I'd like to congratulate you on all these wonderful activities you've just outlined for us that has contributed significantly to the school culture. You've really improved the school climate with all of your activities and your leadership and your modeling for other students. So we really appreciate that. Great job. Thank and you. thank you, Ms. Taylor. Yeah. Thank you, girls. Yeah. And Ms. O'Shea is also here, yes. our middle school principal. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Taylor, were you, or, or Ms. O'Shea, were either of you wanting to say anything? No? Okay. Um, no, no. Not really. I okay. All right. Um, public comment on the CMS ASB presentation. Thank you. So, uh, teacher support staff leadership want to thank the students for their presentation. That was awesome. Uh, it was clear, it was informative, it was engaging. Uh, your teachers, your instructional aides, librarians, office staff, custodians, they all speak so highly of you. And uh, uh, we're really impressed with your energy and your creative ideas. So, thank you. Uh, Union leadership also wants to thank the school board on this topic for investing in our middle school students and for restoring the CMS ASB class. Restoring that class was a big deal for the middle school uh, as we knew it before the arrival of Ms. Rigby and Ms. O'Shea. Uh, a few years ago, a decision was made even before the COVID pandemic to reduce the CMS ASB to a lunchtime club held once a week. And this year, and 22-23, it's been returned to a full instructional period, and that is what it deserves. And look, we're seeing the difference, aren't we? The restoration of the CMS ASB class effectively reinvests in CMS students and programs by promoting student leadership, as you said, across the campus and even around the community, such as here. When the district chose to reduce the CMS ASB to further build its reserve balances, staff, faculty, and union leadership discouraged site administration's support for that decision. And now, with increased resources invested in the program, in the CS, CMS ASB, the community is gaining a better sense of what was lost and what is possible when we invest in this level in the, you know, taking those district's lofty reserves and engaging students in a different way um, who are led, again, by a credentialed full-time and highly qualified teacher like Ms. Taylor. So again, we appreciate this bright spot at CMS and we encourage district leadership and the school board to consider other areas of similar investment in our students and in instructional programs. Thank you. Any further public comment? Fabulous. Uh, we have a presentation on the Brown Act by legal counsel Craig Price. Good evening. Hi, Craig. Eric, we haven't met, but I'm one of your constituents, so <laughs> I look forward to meeting you off site one of these days. Um, I have a handout. Can I bring it up and let you pass it around? Mm -hmm. 
You're all welcome to one group. And there's some others here. Um, Diana, we didn't talk about a time frame for me to uh, do this because a lot of these things can go on for, you know, let's say an hour, and I'm suspecting that you'd like to keep it under that, um, what do you think, 20 minutes, half hour, something like that? 20 minutes sounds wonderful. <laughs> Does it? Okay. So as we go through this board, and I know a number of you have been through it more than you care to go through it again, Sally. Andy, yes. But, um, you know, there are some new things. But I hope um, at some point along the way that if you have any questions or comments that you want to make about the Brown Act, just interject because it's more about trying to convey some information to you that even um, with you experienced board members, you might find useful in some way. So, um, start out. First of all, I think you know, certainly in your own practice, all your meetings now are um, on site. No more virtual meetings. The allowance that you've had during the COVID period to have virtual only meetings uh, pursuant to the governor's orders, that all expires on February 28. And with a couple of minor exceptions, we're reverting to the old Brown Act rules. What does that mean? It means that if one or even two of you are uh, not able to make a meeting because you're on a trip, um, whatever that may be, you have the ability to still attend virtually as long as your virtual attendance and location is posted on the agenda for the meeting and that wherever you are, you also post the agenda so that, and it's pretty theoretical, but the law requires it, um, if there is somebody at the location where you are and where you've posted your agenda, they can attend, it, attend as well at that place. So for example, I've had you know, people that are in a hotel in New York City and they put a notice of the agenda on their door. It's required. Um, if you're on a cruise, no, it doesn't work that way. But one or two of you at a time can attend virtually by meeting those old requirements. There's actually a new law that just um, was passed that stops short, I think, of being very useful. It allows some exceptions to the rule that I just specified for uh, what's called just cause or an emergency situation, like a family medical emergency. But um, it seemed odd to me that in neither situation, just cause or emergency, is there any allowance if there's a giant rainstorm and a flood and you can't get to the school board meeting. It would seem as though in recent California history that somebody would have taken that into account, but they didn't. Anyway, uh, by and large, we're back to the um, former rules about your participation in meetings. Um, sometimes uh, folks get confused about the distinction between a regular meeting and a special meeting. A special meeting can be just about almost anything. There are some limitations on a special meeting in terms of approving things like um, administrator salaries, because the theory is that you want to make sure that people have the maximum notice so that nobody is going to sneak anything in, like happened years ago in the city of Bell. That's why they have this rule. But the difference between a special meeting and a regular meeting is a special meeting requires 24 hours notice. A regular meeting is pursuant to the schedule that you set every December when you have your organizational meeting. Um, if you have a workshop, if you have a board training, 
you can call it anything you want, but where the five of you are summoned together to do district meeting, that's a meeting. It's covered by the Brown Act. And if it's not a regular meeting, then it's a special meeting. So there's no distinction between a study session, a board retreat, and a special meeting. They're all the same. Uh, the fact that there is less uh, notice required for a special meeting can be helpful. Sometimes, as I know you've had come up, an agenda gets posted on a Friday, and then something happens over the weekend, and the superintendent really wants to bring it to your attention, but it's too late to change the agenda, and she doesn't want to wait for the next meeting a couple weeks hence. So in that situation, the workaround is that on Monday morning, a special meeting can be noticed for the same time in the same place, and you post it and you add whatever that agenda item is, and then when you get to the regular meeting, like where you are now, the board president says, okay, at the appointed time, you adjourn or you recess, excuse me, the regular meeting and say, okay, now we're going to go to the special meeting and take up topic X. So there is a way that you can, in effect, add um, last minute items as long as it's outside of the 24 hour notice period. For other things that are, quote, emergencies, the Brown Act is very, very strict. And um, there are very few things that qualify as an emergency. And we've had a lot of what most of us would consider emergencies the last few years, but very few, if any, of those would qualify. So um, everything that involves the board getting together for a meeting or getting together outside of a meeting is covered by the Brown Act. The Brown Act covers the required procedures for noticing a meeting, the information that needs to be provided, the way in which it's got to be agendized, um, allowance for certain types of closed sessions, etc. And it also provides for what is allowed, or more accurately, what's not allowed among board members outside of a meeting. Um, when it comes to uh, board activities, your actions and get-togethers are obviously covered by the Brown Act. All of your standing committees are covered by the Brown Act. In other words, any group or body that you appoint is also viewed as a legislative body and has to conform to the Brown Act. There's one exception, though. And that is, if there is an ad hoc committee that is appointed of no more than two of you and no one else to take on a particular subject and evaluate it with the thought that it will be brought back to the board. It's not a long duration committee. It's a special assignment. There is a unique exception in the Brown Act that allows that to occur. So any two of you can be appointed by the rest of the board to attend to a certain task. You can't have the superintendent on that ad hoc committee, but that's a distinction without a difference because you can invite her to attend that committee and that's perfectly acceptable. So that's something that on occasion can be um, a useful way for the board to act in a way that saves a lot of time on subjects that ultimately are going to come back before the entire board and the closed session in any event. On number four on the, um, on the page, the first page before you, uh, you probably know there was a law passed in 2017 having to do with um, <coughs> social media. And if one of you goes on Facebook, for example, and says, I think thus and such, this new law, or almost new law, prohibits any other board member from going on and saying anything about what the first board member said. I agree, I disagree, etc. It doesn't matter. 
if the people who are commenting make up a quorum or not. It's just if one person says something having to do with district business, you can't go on and further that conversation. Obviously, if somebody is acknowledging some outstanding performance that, say, a student athlete is engaged in, and anybody can say, me too. I can't imagine that's going to be a violation. Um, so the agenda description and um, your staff, Monica, really does a good job with these. I, I look at them and keep up with things from time to time, not every meeting. But um, there's a requirement that you don't need to spend more than 20 or 25 words on an agenda item, but it needs to fairly describe what it is that you're talking about. So if uh, in San Diego they have an agenda item that says planning for future facilities, and that's it, and then they have a whole team of architects and engineers and planners, and they come in and they talk about the new stadium that they want to build, no, that doesn't work. And the courts have made that very clear. It's very logical. Um, is it possible to bring up some item that's not agendized if you only want to discuss it? No. There's no opportunity for that. Certainly, you can talk about dates and times, get-togethers, that kind of thing, but nothing substantive. The requirements of the Brown Act are not predicated upon whether you are going to be taking or considering action. I had a situation recently that came up, actually, at the City College. There was a little bit of a controversy because there was an item that was on the agenda for one of their groups there that was listed as a discussion item. And at the end of that, somebody made a motion per Robert's rules and said, move to action. So then they went ahead and they took action and they adopted that. And it was something that was somewhat controversial. And the answer to that, because there was an issue raised where they had to call me, the answer to that is, regardless of what Robert's rules say, um, the Brown Act trumps. And if something says discussion, you can't then take action on it. Why? I think it's perfectly obvious, as was the case in the situation I just described, because somebody reads that agenda and they say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about them acting on it. Um, I'll go next time, whenever they're actually proposing action. And those people or that person didn't get an opportunity uh, in this particular case. You know, one of the things that comes up all the time, I think, is um, in terms of response to public comments. Ordinarily, you don't respond to public comments. Nobody does. Some people think that it's impermissible to do that. Actually, it's not impermissible. It's just generally regarded as inadvisable because those comments frequently are going to go off onto some other subject area. You can't introduce and talk about different subjects. It's not agendized. There's no prep. Your staff hasn't dealt with it. And so it's um, relatively rare, I think, when the occasion presents when you would want to respond to public comments. But on the other hand, sometimes there is um, a misunderstanding on the part of the public. There's a controversial issue, and people are hounding you and saying, can I get an answer? Can I get an answer? And um, people don't understand, by and large. And I think that in those occasional instances, and I know you've done that, Diana's done that, <coughs> it's important to say, well, we do have an answer. And this just isn't the time when we're going to be able to talk about it. We're going to, the board's going to have it brought back at a future meeting, whatever it is. But <clears throat> don't ever think that you're so hamstrung that the discomfort at, of a particular moment when you may have people at home that are watching on television, that that can't be addressed. Because it can, and sometimes it should be. What about your um, uh, acting outside of a meeting? Um, 
I looked at your protocols that Monica was kind enough to send over, and I think, you know, that's really well covered. And, um, uh, you know, one of you can email somebody. You can email each other about a schedule for when you can get together. But other than that in district business, um, you should stay away from that. And the problem is if one of you emails another board member about some particular issue, there's no Brown Act violation with that. But then if board member number two forwards that to board member number three, boom, then you get into what they call a collective concurrence and you've got a problem. A lot of um, uh, administrators and people that do what I do are now even advising against um, superintendent reports that go out, emails to the board on various subjects, and I don't agree with that. I think um, it's perfectly fine, for example, for an email to go out to say, this is to advise that I'm going to be bringing forth at the next board meeting, you know, this particular topic that you've all been interested in. On the other hand, if there is a topic that you are considering and there is an email that says, I want to let you know where I stand on this or what it is that I'm proposing to do. That's a different story altogether. Once again, it's common sense. It really is. Nothing more than that. Um, closed sessions, again, um, only for personnel labor negotiations, litigation, real estate negotiations, because those are exceptions that are listed in the government code, in the Brown Act itself. And in terms of how they have to be described on the agenda, there's very particular language that is supposed to be followed. And so, again, Monica does a very good job with that. And if there are any questions that from time to time come up, um, we'll get a note about that. Um, it's also uh, important to remember that while you are you're required to report out actions that you take in closed session, you're not required to report out every action because there's a separate Brown Act section that says 54957.1. See, I've been doing this too long. There's a separate Brown Act section that says these are the type of actions from closed session that have to be reported out. And when you go through there, what you find is that there are a number of things that you decide in closed session that you even take a vote on that you don't have to report out. And from time to time, that can be critical. Um, Okay, what about voting? I don't know how often you do a roll call vote. Do you generally do a roll call vote just on important items? But resolutions and, and agenda. Okay, Gen good. Generally. Good. I've just heard an awful lot of lawyers advise their clients that you need to do a roll call vote on everything, which I think is ridiculous. What the Brown Act was amended a few years ago to say is that the public has the absolute right to know how each of you voted on every item. It doesn't mean at that particular, I, it means there has to be a record of it so that the minutes are going to say motion second unanimous or four to one and who voted which way. So just focus on the important things for purposes of a re resolution to make sure. Yeah, I, I believe the roll call on everything came about during COVID. Um, right. dirt, when it was virtual, every item had to be done by roll call to get a very distinct I, nay, abstain, whatever it was. Absolutely. And fortunately, for many reasons, we're out of that right now. I don't know. Um, this actually came up, you know, uh, in terms of someone voting to abstain, um, at one point I remember um, it was felt that that was treated as a vote that went with the majority. But that's not the case any longer. That's been clarified. Uh, for your parent organizations, 
PSA, PTA, different uh, groups. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but they are required to comply with some similar regulations that are contained in the Green Act. So we've got the Brown Act and we've got the Green Act. Um, and um, I'm happy to provide any information if there's any questions about that. The last thing I really want to talk about is the Public Records Act. Um, there, until a few years ago, there was a question about um, uh, what would be required to be made available to requesters. And it's just important for everybody to realize that as time goes on, the law is more and more comprehensive in favor of um, uh, the public's right to receive communications. And so what that means is that not only in your district email, but in your personal email or your text messages, if there is a request made for records that pertain to a certain subject matter, um, then the district has the obligation to pursue collecting those records and asking you about those. Obviously, there are a number of exemptions that apply. And for things that don't uh, pertain to district business per se, for things that are involved with personnel, for things that are involved with attorney-client privilege and on and on and on, there are any number of exceptions. But um, people uh, I've seen continue to overlook the fact that when they're text messaging and that kind of thing that, um, because we can be pretty casual in the way that we text message sometimes. I'm certainly, certain men of you are that way, but I know I am. And it's just important to watch that when you're doing any kind of district business. So that's my, um, that's my quick version. Any questions from any of you folks? I don't think so. That was like a good refresher for us. And I believe, Eric, you're taking like a new board member session. And there's kind of a crash course on Brown Act there as well. So to get you on par with some of the more detailed stuff. Um, but that was a really good kind of high level look at it and refresher, which is good for everybody. OK, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Do we have public comment? <clears throat> Sorry. You know President Jay Holchner? Okay. Thank you. So um, the board agenda did not provide much insight into Mr. Price's presentation. Um, although we were unsure, we being the union, were unsure what Mr. Price would be sharing, we're pleased that he addressed several of the limits and opportunities surrounding communication available to both board members and the community members they serve and who may wish to communicate directly with those board members. A few interesting details and questions stood out. Um, one that Mr. Price covered is, can board members respond to public comments? And if we're correct, what we heard was, yes, they can. Uh, at times, it is appropriate to clarify and provide a response. Uh, at others, it may not be. Uh, don't ever think that you are so hamstrung that an issue can't be addressed. Uh, another detail that stood out was that members of the public may not be required to sign in or identify themselves as a condition of attendance or to speak. And that's the piece I want to cover is or to speak. The community has seen up until recently, the school board refused to allow public speakers because they hadn't submitted such information before the board meeting began. This practice seems in conflict with the guidance shared by Mr. Price. We hope that you all will resolve that and do away with such conflict in the future. All items distributed before or during meetings must be available to the public at the meeting. Uh, that was um, something Mr. Price shared this evening, if I captured that correctly. Uh, union leadership is interested in learning how the district will ensure that this occurs. 
Um, this evening, Mr. Price's summary document may serve as an example of where we're trying to figure out where does that line get drawn. Um, in that it was available to those present. He provided it to you and he provided it to um, our administrators off to the right. And um, I was able to come up and grab it and appreciated that, Mr. Price. Um, uh, but how will the district share the same information with those attending meetings virtually or online or via video? Or, and is there even an obligation? I'm not sure, but that was the question I had for you, Mr. Price. Um, and then finally, as time goes on, um, I believe this was, if not an, a direct quote, um, it was certainly, I'm certainly trying to capture what Mr. Price shared. As time goes on, the law is more and more comprehensive to the public's right to communications. This is regarding public information requests. So again, as time goes on, the law is more and more comprehensive to the public's right to communications. If there is a request made for records, the district has an obligation to pursue those records and ask you about them and you to provide them if you have them. And that includes texts. I, he didn't say it like this, but it, I understood him to say that includes texts and emails and I believe written memos as well, along with all formal documentation um, of the school district. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any further public comment? Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, E6, Carpenter High School Area Crosswalk Safety Improvements Preliminary Plans Presentation. Uh, we have the Public Works Director, John Lawson, and John Merrill of LIN Consulting, uh, presenting the preliminary plans for the Carpenter High School Area Crosswalk Safety Improvements Project. <laughs> okay. Good evening, uh, Board President Diamond, Board members. This is actually my first time in your board meeting. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, John Lawson, Public Works Director, City of Carpinteria in the Public Works Department. Uh, we have also have a guest here, which is the design engineer, John Merrill of Lynn Consulting. Before I hand off the microphone over to John Merrill, I'm just gonna talk about a little bit of the brief history of what this project, uh, the impetus, I guess, so to say. Uh, unfortunately, it all starts off with uh, an injury or an accident or sometimes a fatality. Um, fortunately, for this particular project, at this, it, uh, this crosswalk, um, no fatality. However, recorded injuries uh, through, a tra through uh, traffic collision reports. And I think uh, the one that actually sparked this project was the last um, incident, traffic incident of, correct me if I'm wrong, 2020, 2019. Uh, basically, it was, I, rem I do recall it was pre-pandemic. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was uh, tw 20, I believe. 20. Um, it was immediately before, we had, there was a cluster of incidents around town, and it was immediately before COVID. Uh, that's right. The existing condition right now is a flashing beacon crosswalk, where basically it's demand actuated. Uh, it has helped some. And this particular project is basically going to upgrade that crosswalk to what we call a high-intensity activated crosswalk. And here on I'm going to call it HAWK system. How they came up with that acronym, I don't know. Uh, but it's a, it's a particular uh, uh, hybrid traffic signal uh, between your conventional and a flashing beacon. So, what, so what's the objective of this project? The objective really is to provide more of a, what we call a countermeasure uh, to vehicular and pedestrian conflicts. And hopefully this project will, and we believe it will, um, mitigate that conflict between vehicles and pedestrians, especially the, the school children that cross there on a daily basis. So this particular project is definitely a priority between both agencies or both organizations 
the Carpenter Unified School District in the city of Carpinteria. The, just a little bit about the financial part of it. It is funded through the city under Measure A and what we call development impact fees. Development impact fees are basically what developers pay into the system to mitigate development impacts. So those are your sources of funding. No, uh, no funding is coming from the Unified School District, uh, Carpenter Unified School District, excuse me. So it's all city funded project. <coughs> And with that, I do like to turn it over to John Merrill, our design engineer, to uh, go over the process, especially the project process, if you're not too familiar, familiar with how a capital project uh, is going through. We, uh, right now, we're in our design phase. That's we're right. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about a little bit about the construction schedule or the tentative schedule to that. Uh, but uh, without further ado, John Merrill, uh, traffic engineer of Lynn Consulting. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yeah. So what we can do, um, and it, let me introduce myself again. John, my name is John Merrill. I'm with Lynn Consulting. Consulting. I'm a, a civil engineer and a traffic engineer. Um, so Matt, uh, uh, to the board chair, Diamond, thank you very much for having, allowing us to present this to, dear, to you today. I, I want to keep it kind of brief. I want to talk maybe just a little bit about the project itself, the physical improvements and then I'll talk a little bit about the process as well because the, the important part to understand is where we're at in the process and what we are going to be doing moving forward. And it might be a little difficult to see. Um, can we zoom it in? I can zoom it in with the, the plus sign. There. Oh there. Yeah. We'll just see. Okay, it's just a PDF. Okay. So essentially, the project is about improving the crosswalk, not only putting in a higher level uh, device that will help pedestrians cross, but also relocating the crosswalk slightly to the west. Would this will allow a better visibility, or, better, or what we in the engineering field would call a line of sight, uh, between pedestrians that are waiting to cross and vehicles that are oncoming. And essentially, that's, that's really what this project is all about, is, is improving and enhancing the safety at the intersection. You can see that there is a slight curve in the existing trail system and then intersecting just about, I would say, about 20 feet to the east. It's a very slight change in the alignment, but enough that it will provide a better line of sight. Regarding the process, I wanted to make sure um, it go through a little little of the of the process step by step. So at, when the city first started looking at this, this is before they had brought me on to do the design. The city looked at three different alternatives. They looked at doing a crosswalk exactly in the same location. They looked at doing a crosswalk at the staff driveway or, ne or adjacent to the staff driveway, and they looked at doing a crosswalk adjacent to the student parking driveway. And there were considerable pros and cons with doing both, uh, and, and very much so having to do with cost, but also other complications as well. One aspect of this project um, that might not be everyone aware, may, may not be aware of is this is Foothill Road, which is actually a Caltrans route. Because it's a Caltrans route, that means we have to, ha the city of Carpinteria has to have permission to install the improvements within state right of way which means that it has to be installed per the state requirements, which means that the state has to review the, the design. It's a very onerous task when you, you start getting several different uh, stakeholders involved, the state being one of them. On top of that, you have a flood control channel just to the south of there that's owned by the Santa Barbara County Flood Control District, Watershed District, right, John? Flood control. Flood control, okay. They are involved in this as well because the parcel, the triangle parcel just south of the crosswalk is actually owned by the Flood Control District. On top of that, you also have Carpentry Unified School District and some of this, uh, these improvements will be on school district property. And not only that, <laughs> but we have a major water main running just north of Foothill Road 
uh, that is owned by the U.S. Department of the Interior, Bureau of Water Reclamation, that we are dodging to make sure that we can continue to provide water service and be able to allow access for maintenance of that. So there's a lot of moving parts. And it's not as simple as just installing a traffic signal. So where we're at right now in the process is we've talked to Caltrans. We've actually gotten a positive response from Caltrans. We made some adjustments to what we're proposing. We're now ready to go to back to Caltrans. We're ready to go back and, and, and confirm the re those, those revisions. But before doing that, the city would like to present this design to the school district so that you are aware of where we're at in the project. Once we are able to move forward on that design, the next step would be to do f what we'd call a formal design review. That's when we get start to get comments from Caltrans and they start to go in the, in the, into the little the details of everything. Does it meet this standard? Is it exactly that distance away? Are you using this type of product that meets this requirement? And then all those other agencies as well. So it will be a, a multi-tiered process. What I want to convey most of all, however, is that the design that you see right now, this is preliminary. This is not permanent. This is not exactly the way things have to be. But this is the recommendation that the city of Carpinteria has for the school district. And the, the, the school district has been working with the, uh, I think it was. The Jeremiah Sabin. Yeah. I don't, know, I don't know what his title is. Assistant principal of the high school. Yeah. yeah. Thank okay. You. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'll be here to answer any remaining questions as well as John Lawson. Uh, board members, I'm just going to pull up on screen next of what this Hawk system would look like. Uh, again, this is just an example, but this is what a Hawk system looks like. I don't know what particular town or city that is in, but uh, really the focus is on what a Hawk system looks like. So how that operates is basically red and green bulbs. Uh, is there a yellow? Yeah. Yes. So you, yeah. you push. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Go to the microphone. So you push the walk button. Immediately, two yellow lights start flashing. Then they come on solid. And then a red solid indication comes on. That's when you're allowed to walk. That red solid in indication is theoretically going to stay on for the duration of whoever is currently waiting to be able to cross. After that, the red indication starts flashing. That indication when it's flashing legally means you are allowed to proceed after a full stop and, and ensuring that no pedestrians are within the crosswalk. And then after the red flashing indication ceases, it remains blank. It doesn't operate like a typical traffic signal. It's, it's, in between, it's, it's not a signal, but it's a beacon. And beacons do not operate 24-7. That's the only difference. Do the pedestrians have a timer as well? Yeah, there, there is a crosswalk timer. The, the visible timer to, yeah. the, to the pedestrian. Yeah, it would be visible. For several years, I, at the beginning of school, because kids and staff are not at the high school. I have volunteered to help the crosswalk, the security people from the high school. Um, there are many students who just, because it's a crosswalk, they just head out, assuming that the traffic's going to stop. Um, there are a lot of near misses. The cars are not always cognizant that there's a crosswalk or there's kids, but um, a lot of it has to do with the kids. And I think if this goes in, you're going to have to have a lot of training. We'll have to have a lot of training um, of students and how to work the system that they just can't walk across. Um, and that is a problem. I don't know if either one of you have gone and been up there during the morning or the afternoon. OK. Because morning is fairly light. They stagger in. Um, in the afternoon, they all come in mass. Um, walking across. So it really does require two people beyond what this might be, but I'm, I'm assuming you've taken all that into consideration. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's uh, before we go into design the the concept process or the concept phase. There's always a traffic study, and that traffic study, just like John Merrill mentioned, is in, is in collaboration with the with Caltrans. So before we even get into a design, which you saw earlier, we have to have a traffic study or engineering study. And that takes into account field conditions, observations, your school times, morning uh, and afternoon. So those particular times are, are, have been observed. So you've seen a significant change in, in traffic patterns there over the last year then, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes, sir. I've been here for f about four years now. Yeah, I mean, but with the since, with the freeway yeah. in, you know, opening yes. up all the way to, to Santa Claus now, it seems like the the um, load on on 192 is is has decreased significantly, significantly. increased, mm -hmm. and people do not drive 25 miles an hour. Um, well, thank you for presenting. Um, this is something that was a priority for me um, before I was a school member, school board member, um, and when all of a sudden there was an uptick in incidents, um, the city uh, and I believe Doss Williams at the time and some others created a uh, traffic committee ad hoc group and um, we were able as parents to come and give our input on what we think some of the issues are um, that are that were causing it. And it wasn't just at this school site, it was at multiple school sites. There were issues and the city has been really great and responsive to um, a lot of the issues that were addressed. Um, and, I, and I really want to thank you for that. Um, the traffic flow and the increase in uh, crossing guard staff at the middle school and at, at at Canalino and Aliso, it's been fabulous. Um, and we really appreciate that. The Hawk system, um, for those that aren't familiar in our area, there is one in Goleta, um, located on Hollister and Old Town, right across, right at the community center, I believe that is, or Veterans Building, community center, right? Um, and so if you're interested in what that is, there's one there for you to go check out. But definitely there is an aspect of once we actually have it coming, um, education for the public at large, but also our students, for sure. Um, and there's an, the, the, the fact that there is only one in the gen, I, there might, I think there's actually another one now in Santa Barbara somewhere, but the lack of presence of Hawk systems to drivers that aren't aware of what they mean is very confusing. I remember when the one in Goleta was first put in, people were like, stop, go, stop, go. Like, they just didn't know what to do and when to do it. Um, so I'm, I, in the beginning, I think that'll be a little bit of a rub. Um, and we'll just need to have heightened presence um, during the first, you know, maybe month or two while that's, once it actually happens, um, of safety staff. Um, the other question, and you said this will be done in kind of the scoping and the evaluation, but um, I know in at least one of the incidents at that site, um, the sunrise was actually an issue and it blinded the driver that wound up coming in contact with a student. Um, and I'm assuming that part of that study will show if moving the crosswalk 20 feet to the west, you said, if that will have any change on that um, as they approach, like will that, at certain times of year around here, there's several streets going straight to schools where you get completely blinded and you have to come to almost a stop. Um, and so I'm concerned about moving that, um, will that, that'll get evaluated, I'm sure. You said different factors is lighting sunrise sunset things like that is that a factor in the study that you guys are going to do the traffic study so uh, school board chair diamond um, one of the things that you will see on any new traffic signal is you have multiple signal heads mm -hmm. right you have the mast arm and that usually has at least one more you more often than that several and then you also have another indication signal head on the side and the reason why that was done as a requirement now uh, under the uh, codes 
is because of a situation just like that, because the sun can be rising in front of you, but you still have to be able to see. Or, you know, sometimes the indication might go out. I mean, we don't have that problem as much as we used to when we had incandescent bulbs. Yeah. Now we have, you know, um, LEDs, but also the sun. Um, and so that will help mitigate that issue. Um, additionally, we did look at potentially looking at putting a border around the back plate. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. even though you can do that on a traffic signal, this, as I said before, is not a, considered to be a traffic signal, and Caltrans will not allow that on mm -hmm. a Hawk signal, which I thought was kind of intriguing. Okay. Um, and then noticing that we are shifting it to the west, um, and we're going to have to, the city will have to move, kind of make Franklin Trail, that trailhead, or the bike path veer off 20 feet off to the side. Does that encroach on the property that's right there? Um, you said it's their property. It's all no, it's all, all the, like property. that one. Yeah, it's all within. No, 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 not the triangular piece. To, when you're looking at it, the property to the left. Oh, the triangle. Right. There Maybe I'm missing it. That's the, that's the nursery's property. That triangle there, okay, is what you're saying. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's still on the thing, that's okay. That's that, that's okay, I was looking over here. I thought it, you meant a piece over here or something. The jog is on the, on the okay. yeah. Okay. That's, that's flood control district flood property. Control, yeah. yeah. Okay, so as it turns to the left there, before it goes up, that doesn't impede on the neighbor property no, at all. The, okay. no that, that, that's all flood control. Thank district. you. That would just needed to clarify that. Okay. What, what's the timeline looking like as far as, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the study's been done, John, and, and uh, um, you're, you're basically fine-tuning this as long as you get approvals from, you know, the district, city's on board, uh, sounds like Caltrans is on board, county's on board. So um, it shouldn't, doesn't seem like it'd be that long of a process to get the, the construction details together, should it? Uh, so right now we're in the design phase, preliminary design. Uh, you would, we would say about at least two more submittals. Two more submittals to Caltrans. Uh, and on, uh, just like John Merrill mentioned, moving parts. There's the design aspect, the technical part of it. Then there's what we call the right-of-way aspect of it. So with Caltrans, we have to sign a, what would they call a maintenance agreement. As, just imagine, that's a contract with, the Cal, with Caltrans. And on, uh, on top of that, there's also an agreement with the County of Santa Barbara, another contract. Uh, those are ones that need to be in place before this gets constructed. Should the school district require the city of Carpinteria to go into some type of contract because it's going to be on the school property? That's something to be determined. Uh, uh, we're not aware of any yet of. But those contracts could be being worked on now, right? Yes. I mean, they, they, okay. they sh they, that should just be a formality <coughs> before the construction documents are ready, correct? That's right. And then the city of Carpenter has its own process to uh, execute these contracts. So these contracts, it's, it's nothing that the city manager, Dave Durer, could just sign. He has to go in front of the city council and request for the authorization of city council to allow him to sign that. That's how the city process goes. So this whole right-of-way process alone, uh, it's, a, it's a long time. I, I don't have a particular time frame what long time means. I do know that we're in the process right now negotiating with Caltrans as well as the County of Santa Barbara on terms. Uh, we're with Caltrans, we, we're barely in the first submittal of that review. With the County of Santa Barbara, we're in our second review with them. So yes, it's a formality. Um, however, it's just, it takes just as long as the design of the project plans. Your construction part of it, once it goes out to consider, that's, pro that's probably the easiest part of this, uh, of this project is just having the right-of-way phase or, or the whole contracts or the agreements in place and then finishing off the design. Oh, did I mention the encroachment permit? No, there's a Caltrans encroachment permit that goes with this. Um, so just imagine, there's basically these are all contracts that we have to sign with these agencies because it's state right-of-way, because it's county property. And hopefully I don't think that we would have any type of 
contract or agreement between the city and the school district? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess the question that I think Andy, Andy was kind of asking, and, and um, when is it is, construction? Is Dave is Dave Durf, is Dave Durflinger going to be the one that actually signs? No. He's retiring. So uh, you're is saying it's official already? Yes. Okay. I so is he going to be the one that actually signs, or are we talking about post Dave, the next person? Well, it could be. Um, yeah, I can't speak for um, our, the city, our city manager. And the the goal is to get these agreements uh, finalized before he retires. Okay. Yeah. That okay. That's yes. that's something. That's, so the, the, okay. the, the question is, when is this going to be constructed? Is uh, the goal is at least start at next school year, pending these agreements are ex executed. Start at the next school at, in the fall. So in the fall, we would yes. start construction. Yes. Okay. That's a goal. I. That's a yeah. great goal. Mm -hmm. So can I ask how much further the crosswalk is west of where it already is? Is it's the crosswalk before the driveway? Twenty, 20 feet. Twenty feet. So right. it's on the other it's side of the, the staff no, driveway. It, no, it's no. on the same no. side as the driveway. It's just approximately 20 feet to the west. So it's still in between the drive, the staff okay. in, but, in driveway. Right, but closer to yeah. the driveway. Yes, closer to the okay. driveway. It also serves to allow Computer. vehicles that are coming out to store oh, okay. there so good. that it actually will make it a little bit easier for folks to get out of the staff parking lot, too. Great. OK, any further questions? OK, public comment. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate you your time. Nice. Thank you. Union President Jay Holcher. We have no comment on the topic. Thank okay. All right. Uh, moving on. E7, public comment on items not on this agenda. Thank you, John. Uh, we have two comments. Sarah Rogner, sir. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm actually here to talk about bargaining. Um, I have to say that I was really disheartened by the health care cap that was in the most recent proposal from the district. That's just such um, a hill to die on for us. Um, and really considering that admin in the district have the same health care that we do, um, it should be their hill to die on too. Um, by the end of my mom's career in the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara district, she was paying $900 a month for her health care. Just deducted straight out of her paycheck every month. And um, the costs are just going to continue to go up. And um, it's, it's, just, it's just a non-starter. Um, each year, we are presented with our yearly contracts that show how much the district contributes to our health care. And it's added into our salaries and to make it look like we make more money. Um, and this is one of the main things that keeps people from just rioting over our extremely low salary schedule. And if you take that away, then what? We're already competing for talented teachers with nearby districts that pay way more than we do here. So that's a huge selling point for people working in this district is fully funded health care. Um, speaking of being competitive and retaining people, COS proposed a $4,000 stipend for B-clad teachers and the district countered with three. Um, just yesterday we were discussing in our morning meeting at uh, the high school about how we're going to deal with this new influx of DLI students coming to the high school. Um, how are we going to pivot our curriculum and staffing to serve this new population of bilingual students? Um, we need to be visionary, not short-sighted. If you want to attract B-clad teachers, competing with every other district um, in this region who is working hard to attract those same teachers, you better make it sweet and you better start now. You basically have three years before those kids are going to be at the high school. Um, also, we have every secretary in this district multitasking as an interpreter every day. We're using these people on the front lines of interfacing with parents and the community who are also dealing with kids throwing up in the, do in the office, mental health crises at the same time, and then we're asking them to interpret in high-stakes IEP meetings. Um, 
So as we begin classified bargaining, which is going to uh, commence soon, we should be looking closely at how we can appreciate these hardworking staff members slash interpreters and compensate them generously with a bilingual stipend, because I know that is bargained separately, but they work extremely hard for our district. Um, another challenge we are facing, most notably at the high school, is what I would consider like a talent brain drain um, of our best and brightest teachers. We're losing teacher leaders left and right to other districts who pay better, that are closer to where people live, so they don't have to commute. Time to stop. Mm. It's unfortunate. I had lots of good things to say. Thank you, Sarah. And if you have your statement written down, feel free to email it. I would love to because, um, yeah. I have lots of things to say. Mm -hmm. uh, any further public comment? Any person in your culture? Let me know when I may begin. <clears throat> Thank you. So our public comment is regarding collective bargaining, as it's not specifically on the agenda this evening. On January 11th, 2023, the union submitted its most recent counter proposals, which addressed the following contract articles. The leave article, Article 13. Again, the certificated, the certificated contract. Article 13, leave. Article 15, safety. And Article 6, compensation and benefits. Union leadership would be happy to discuss any of these proposals directly with school board members. Um, Mr. Price clarified that that's entirely permissible, so we in continue to encourage and invite you to do that. Um, of course, it would be at your request. Uh, thus far, we have received no request to do so, but we continue to encourage a more direct discussion with our school board members in regard to the collective bargaining conversation. Beyond cause and submission of the three union counter proposals, the district did not review or submit either a proposal or counter proposal at any time during the collective bargaining session on January 10th. I'm sorry, January 11th. But it did oddly float an informal proposal to the community after the meeting ended. Never mentioned it to us, but then floated it to the community, which is on its face bad faith bargaining. That said, the union will continue to accept future and reliable district bargaining proposals when presented in official meetings, <coughs> official meetings legally established for that purpose, not via a public email that comes after the meeting when it's not even been mentioned to us. We also continue to encourage school board members to reconsider their posture and their involvement on the collective bargaining teams for the district what used to be a norm in the district prior to Ms. Rigby arriving. The removal of board members at collective bar bargaining meeting, meetings, again, a condition brought by our superintendent and nurtured by our human resource director. Um, no, it's not, but we'd be happy to debate that at any time you like, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, this is a condition that's been both exceedingly expensive and destructive to the bargaining environment especially in regard to the bargaining partner's ability to reach well-informed and productive agreements designed to benefit district students, families, employees, and the community of Carpinduria. Each one of you could be participating on these committees if you so chose to direct the superintendent that way. And we have huge, enormous concerns that you are not receiving valid, accurate updates about what's happening in that bargaining room while we are subjected to taunting lawyers, to the taunting lawyer, and to the silence of Ms. Zapata. So please consider that. We'd like you to get more involved, directly involved. Thank you. OK. Um, I, I would like to point out that uh, there was a time for public comment on negotiations at 4.30 prior to the closed session. Um, yeah, we wanted to speak in open session to the community. And, and if we miss that, then. So that actually happened. The public comment happens here before we go into closed session. Thank you. Is Thank how. Start the meeting off with that next time. But I think the important. That's at 4.30. So nobody was here. So if nobody's here, then we don't the do that. The important thing for the union is that in public comment, we share the 
share this with you. I think we did that tonight. We did that successfully, okay. and we did that transparently. I, I just wanted to let you know that there is a time for the, if it's like specifically for this item that you were talking about, negotiations, it was on as a closed session item, and there is public comment time before that we'll for that opportunity. I just wanted to let you know, people may not understand what that meant, and I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Podcast? So. Uh, yes. But typically, there's nobody here. Correct. Thank you for the opportunity. Yep. OK. Um, moving on. F1, board policies. Board policy and administrative regulation 3250 transportation fees, first reading. The board is asked to approve the first reading of BP and AR 3250 transportation fees. Whenever the cost of providing student transportation exceeds funding provided by the state, the governing board may charge fees for home to school student transportation and other transportation services as expressly authorized by law. May we get a, a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Um, public comment on F1. Evening, President J. Hutcher. We'll try to speed it along. No, thank you. We retract our comments on the topic. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, we do not charge for that service, correct? We do not charge any transportation fees. The reason why we bring the board policy to you today is that there was an update in the law and we're required to change our policy. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, F2, Board Policy and Administrative Regulation 5131.7, Weapons and Dangerous Instruments, first reading. The board is asked to approve the first reading of BP and AR 5131.7, Weapons and Dangerous Instruments. The governing board recognizes that students and staff have the right to a safe and secure campus for free from physical and psychological harm and desires to protect them from the dangers presented by firearms and other weapons. May I get a motion? I move to approve board policy administrative regulation 5131.7. All second. Uh, public comment. Union President Jay Hochner. Thank you. So um, given the disciplinary concerns, primarily at the middle school, uh, we just, the union would like to ask that you take a less permissive approach to the concept of weapons, any kind of weapons, things that can be used as weapons, um, rather than a, um, a more permissive approach, which seems to be the theme under Principal Lisa O'Shea. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion among you? No? Okay. Uh, may, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. G1, the 2022 Schools Accountability Report Card. The board is asked to approve the 2022 Schools Accountability Report Card for Carpentria Unified School District Schools. February 1 of each year, every school in California is required by state law to publish a School Accountability Report Card, SARC. The SARC contains information about the condition and performance of each California public school under the Local Control Funding Formula, LCFF. All local educational agencies, LEOs, are required to prepare a Local Control and Accountability Plan, LCAP, which describes how they intend to meet annual school-specific goals for all pupils with specific activities to address state and local priorities. Additionally, data is reported in an LCAP Data reported in an LCAP is to be consistent with data reported in the SARC. May I get a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. And public comment. <coughs> Union President Jay Hotchner. We have no comments at this time. Okay, any discussion? No? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 H1, warrants. The board is asked to approve the warrants for the period of January 6, 2023 through January 19, 2023 in the amount of $1,271,063.46. Warrants are issued once a week on Thursdays. The report format shows check, check number, check date, payee, brief account description, payment comment, and check amount. May I get a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. 
and public comment. Union President Jay Hochner. <coughs> Uh, once again, union leadership would like to thank those community members who provide grants and gifts to the CUSD with no unethical or unprofessional uh, strings attached. I think you're on the wrong, wrong warrants right now. H1 warrants. I'll be back in a moment. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you can just hang out. It'll be like five seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, H2, gifts, grants, donations. Oh, wait. All, we need to approve. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. H2, gifts, grants, donations, donation from Fidelity Charitable through CEF to CMS. The board is asked to accept the donation from Mr. and Mrs. Bill Howard's Fidelity Charitable Foundation through Carpenteria Education Foundation, CEF, of $3,000 to Carpenteria Middle School students for gift cards for CMS students and families with financial needs. I'll move to approve with gratitude. Second. And public comment. Union President Jay Hochner. Thank you. Sorry for the hiccup. So union leadership wants to thank those community members who provide grants and gifts to the CUSD with no unethical or unprofessional strings attached. Carpentry is known for being an affluent and generous community, as we've said before, and their gifts, be they fiscal or material, are greatly appreciated. Beyond that, the generosity of these donors this time from Mr. Mrs. and Mr. Bill Howard's Fidelity Charitable Foundation serve to support the community, children, and their families, which in turn, we believe, comes back to provide a variety of predictable and even unpredictably positive benefits. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Measure you, I, measure you. I one, summing expenditure report as presented to Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, CBOC. The Citizens Bond Oversight Committee meets quarterly to fulfill their obligation under Proposition 39 for oversight of Measure U. One of their principal duties is to review expenditure reports to ensure that bond proceeds are expended only for the purposes outlined in Measure U. These summary reports are provided to the board for information purposes only. The attached report was provided to the committee on January 18th, 2023, and reflects Measure U bond expenditures for the period of April 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. May I get a motion to, uh, well, no, no it's no action, right? No action. We're not accepting it? No, it's information. Information only. Okay. Um, public comment on I won. Union President Jay Hotcher. No okay. Uh, I two approval of lawn repairs after the removal of the portables at CHS admin building. The board is asked to approve the contract increase with McGillivray Construction in the amount of twenty one thousand seven hundred ninety three dollars and twenty six cents for the removal of eight inch and foreseen base under the portables used as interim housing for the admin building. On December thirteenth, twenty twenty two, the board approved the cost for demolition and removal of the portables, including stairs and concrete landings. Safe off electrical services, including fire and data lines, ter data lines terminations, and an allowance for repairs to irrigation and plants in the amount of one hundred seventeen thousand eight hundred seventy-four and thirty-two cents. The cost of removal of the base is twenty-one thousand seven twenty-three and ninety-six cents, and will be paid with Measure U funds. May I get a motion? I move to approve. A second. Public comment. Union President Jay Hochner. I too. So we have no further comments until letter J personnel. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I-3, Canino Plumbing Project, Assistant Superintendent Business Services Marine Fitzgerald will present and explain Canino Plumbing issues to the steps to correct and the steps to correct them. So this uh, past summer, with the completion of all of Canalino's phases of modernization, um, uh, the dis with all the staff and students returning, the site started to have plumbing issues. Um, at, at the beginning of the planning phase of Canalino's modernization in 2016, um, they had both uh, plumbing contractor and the engineers out there determine, you know, sneaking all the lines, cameraing all the lines to determine if they were adequate. 
and there were many, many plumbing repairs done during each phase of uh, modernization, um, including phase four in Canalino. Subsequently, um, when everyone came back, they started having backups. And as a result of that, um, Jim Pettit and Jay uh, Sullivan were at the site almost every day trying to figure out why. One of the things that, we've did, that we um, concluded pretty after <laughs> pretty much every week since school is open, having some major backup, is the requirement now for the, the school site now has completely um, renovated every bathroom to low flow toilets, which are required by law. The main line, c kind of coming through Canalino that goes out to the street, is a four-inch line, and it's just been, you know, it just is not sufficient. It's technically adequate, engineered technically adequate, but it's not sufficient with the low-flow toilets to move the waste through. So it's continuous backups. So um, as a result, uh, we have had last Tuesday. Uh, the Measure U team, Jim and Jay Sullivan, Robert Robles, architect Robert Robles, met with an engineer out there um, to determine the best solution to remedy the plumbing issues. So um, currently, we are going to be entering into a design phase to remove, to repair, remove and repair the main line coming almost like through the whole, almost the entire walkway path inside the campus. That, that's kind of where the cafeteria is in the back to the back gate. So that's an unknown cost. It has to get done. Um, it was not uh, part of the design of modernization. So that is where we are. In the meantime, um, there have been three additional cleanouts put throughout the campus during the breaks, as well as, um, oh, what are they called? Um, high flow diaphragms. So it's like forcing a low flow toilet to flush high, high, high volumes of water in certain areas of the campus to get to make sure it pushes through, especially in the kindergarten area, which is where we are having a big problem. And he's also ha he also has hoses on the roof because there's no other way, and he's got timed hose flushing to make sure the lines are cleared out. Um, we've also bought a, a commercial snake and a commercial uh, camera. So we're able to not wait for plumbers. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, they'll go through the design phase that will determine um, how we're going to fix it, the extent of it needing to be fixed and repaired. But ultimately, the lines will have to be increased to a, a, a larger size. The entire system or just, just the main? Just the main. It's just that, like, so, it, so like behind the admin building, that run of walkway, it's there. So everything else feeds into it through a, uh, like the laterals come into it th into a Y. Well, there's a lot of Ys in that campus. Yeah. It's designed very different than the other schools. So the other schools don't have these huge long runs of pipe. And they're, for whatever reason, I mean, decades ago, they have a larger pipe infrastructure even going out to the street than Canalino. Um, there's a lot of plumbing repairs done um, through all the phases of modern, modernization, but this one main line is one that did not get touched. So it, it's pretty much been concluded that that's, that's the only alternative we have right now. In the meantime, some of the temporary fixes have worked, um, but they're not sustainable. I mean, they're still out there every couple of times a week. Okay. So, so um, I mean, it's a problem. It has to be fixed. Mm -hmm. We can't, this is not something we can leave. Um, you said you, we've bought some equipment, um, and is our staff adequately, or pro I guess more than adequately, thoroughly trained on how to use this equipment that we haven't had before? Yes. Um, so that it's being, it's not causing more harm than good, essentially, making things worse. Right now, Jim uh, is the one who's using the equipment, and he is familiar with it and he knows how to use it, and he's currently training staff, the maintenance staff to be able to do the same thing. Uh, plumbing's a dirty job, um, but these tools uh, will allow us to fix problems immediately and not have to like shut bathrooms down. I mean, it, 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 you know, we've had to wait sometimes uh, almost the entire day, over four hours, for even an emergency repair guy to come out. And in the meantime, you've got backup, which is not good. So 
we are um, doing everything we can right now to make sure that the site is functionable and not, not having uh, repeated problems. But this is probably something that will have to take place over the summer, and it'll, it'll have to get done. Okay. Any questions right now? Any other questions? Okay, public comment. Oh, uh, there's no public comment on this item. Okay. Uh, and this was just a presentation, so information. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, J Personnel, J1 Personnel Summary. The board is asked to approve the following recommended personnel items. Assignments, five personnel resignations, two, release and probation, two, unpaid leave of absence, one. Uh, may I get a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. And public comment on J1. Union President Jay Hochner. Thank you. So once again, the personnel report clarifies the efforts of the CUSD's Human Resource Department under Ms. Zapata's supervision. While the CUSD continues its effort to resolve staffing shortages, much of which are a result of the district's own doing, it shuffles already reliable employees from one position to another. Just take a look at the personnel list. While hiring about as many new employees as there are employees exiting the district. The overall condition of shortage remains intact. Meanwhile, district leadership has not provided any response in regard to the conditions so accurately described by several public speakers, primarily district instructional aides and faculty members, at the recent, uh, what would it be, the December 13th school board meeting. Union leadership continues to seek clarification on the topics cited in their public comments. The inability of the district, of district leadership to even significantly amend its recruiting, hiring, and maintenance of uh, need, the needed workforce is having a direct and negative impact on the teaching and learning environment. And to be clear, simply responding that these issues are subject to the collective bargaining process and that there's nothing that you can do until we bargain it is far from complete and it is even a somewhat dishonest response. Of course, several matters of hiring, employment, and compensation and benefits are subject to the collective bargaining process. That said, many of the decisions and practices pursued by district leadership in association with this are not. For example, although the high and low ranges cited on teacher and support salary schedules are subject to bargaining, the specific placement on these schedules of new employees by the human resource director and senior administrators is not. Therefore, the decision to provide new employees considerably higher salaries and wages while loyal and highly qualified employees who have served the district for many years receive no increase in their salaries and wages, well, that was and remains a unilateral administrative decision. Similarly, although topics of salary bonuses, retention bonuses, and hiring bonuses may be collectively bargained, the decision to provide many entirely inexperienced new district employees several thousand dollar hiring bonuses while refusing to provide any retention bonuses to the loyal, highly qualified, and longtime district employees was and remains a unilateral administrative decision. Cause leadership again encourages the school board to utilize its authority and to examine, resolve, and improve the variety of personnel challenges and shortages that continue to plague the performance of the Human Resource Director and the District. Thank you. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, board announcements, um, I would first ask, unfortunately I wasn't able to be present, but the city and district, sorry to put you on the spot, Andy, oh, I got uh, had a, notes. our joint meeting last Friday, um, and I'm going to ask Andy uh, to report out on that. All right, so uh, we met with the city and um, had a number of topics to discuss. Uh, the first um, was the Civic Youth Engagement Program that uh, Officer Dickey uh, kind of combined that with his Community Resource um, uh, Officer update. And um, it sounds like they're uh, moving forward with creating a, 
a youth engagement program um, that will that we as a district we we are highly supportive of, and um, to create a, a, a bit more familiarity with with the uh, the city and what it does, and the and the sheriff's department and what it does, and um, try to make a better connection with the youth and some of the some of the kids that are getting into trouble. Um, then we uh, we discussed the pedestrian safety improvements. Um, we heard about one of them this evening. The other project is the uh, system that's going to be installed um, at uh, on the Palm Carp Avenue um, intersection there, and it sounds as if that's going to be. It's a it's a hybrid signal. Uh, is what? No, it's a beacon. it's a beacon. And it's going to be, uh, bid docks are going to be ready this summer. So it should be being constructed, I would say, sometime late summer, early fall. So hopefully by the end of the year, um, it'll be installed. Uh, we had a written update on the library uh, program, and I don't, I don't think I brought that with me. Um, it's on the back of that one. Oh. And, um, just uh, basically touched on the after school homework help um, and uh, the new librarian uh, Jody is uh, is really taking a lot of ownership uh, she grew up in Carbonara went to Carp High um, and it sounds like that's really a, a big attribute to the community um, Matt Roberts gave an update on the aquatics program um, Specifically, the uh, and I specifically asked about the junior lifeguard program, uh, which he anticipates there will not be a, a problem enrolling everyone who wants to be enrolled. The big hic the biggest hiccup that they um, have found is that the um, some of the kids aren't quite ready for the swim. They can't pass the swim test, so there's going to be a push to um, offer swim lessons. Uh, um, in the spring to, to students who you know are interested but maybe don't feel comfortable in the ocean yet and then um, he also said that they're considering a, a smaller pool addition a, a, a swimming lesson pool um, kind of over in that corner opposite the uh, happy hut uh, like a 20 by 20 little pool I think it sounded more like it'd be a Water aerobics pool than it would be a swimming lesson pool, but that's that that was uh, in his presentation. And then um, we talked about he mentioned something about the water quality, um, how they're testing the water in the pool regularly, and it's exceeding standards. Um, and then we talked. Uh, Aaron Maker was not there, so we didn't really get a report on the local new local. Um, waste regulations because I know everyone's probably familiar with those uh, or they've been getting notified but there's a lot of ambiguity as to what that means as far as where you can throw what in your trash but hopefully we'll get an update next time we have a meeting um, city and um, the school district are still working on the joint use agreements and we're going future <coughs> topics are going to be a um, Farming nutrition program, maybe partnering with the the old um, Whitney property at the uh, Casitas uh, Pass off ramp. Uh, some volunteer programs um, to work with the city. That's kind of uh, I think with partly in similar to this youth engagement program, and then um, uh, possibly. This uh, a pool at the high school. I, 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 that, I don't know much information about that. Uh, Councilmember Lee was t uh, mentioned something about it, and then the summer run camps. Uh, we didn't. That's going to be a future agenda item. Uh, I know that uh, Jamie, you, you wanted to talk about that, and then uh, we're going to also talk about a um, workforce housing, and how that how the uh, the city policy on. Um, any development would uh, be amended to include a uh, um, some language to the effect that it would offer uh, um, workforce housing for you know fire police teachers city workers um, 
so I think that's uh, that's already in the works. And our next meeting is April 21st. Thank you very much. I All appreciate right. that. Anybody else have any board announcements? Uh, any activities? Anything going on? No? Okay. Um, this Saturday is the ribbon cutting at Summerlin School, and I am so excited to be there. Um, I would really love for the community to come out and support um, the Summerlin School, all their staff um, who have been, you know, moving and getting their classrooms set up, um, the first, students. First rebuilt school in the South <laughs> County in 30 years. Yeah, um, this is a big deal, but also this is, um, it is a completely brand new school site. This is a jewel in the crown, if you will, and I am really excited for, um, for this, for the community to get a chance to see it and um, and to use it moving forward in the future uh, pretty broadly. So I'm excited for that. Uh, public comment on board announcements? Union President Jay Hocher? No, no okay, next to the board calendar. Monica, anything there? Nope. Uh, no, you just invited everybody to. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I did it. Uh, do we have public comment on the board calendar? Union President Jay Hocher? Okay, and uh, future agenda items. Uh, we have Measure U projects and the 2023-2024 budget development coming up. Um, is there anything you need to say about that? That's wh what we're doing. Okay, public comment on future agenda items. Union President Jay Hochner. All right, so um, the first uh, suggestion for future agenda items regards uh, remuneration, uh, meaning uh, compensation for school board uh, members. This past December, uh, union leadership asked two questions. One was, why doesn't CUSD compensate school board members in any way, be it a stipend, access to a reduced health care package, a uh, capped hourly wage to encourage board members to devote more time on school sites directly examining the challenges and opportunities experienced in the teaching and learning environment. Uh, the other question we asked is, could board member compensation raise our expectations associated with board member engagement and performance, while also serving to remove the economic barriers that currently prohibit more diverse participation on the school board? Just like educators and support staff uh, need better compensation so that they may avoid the distractions that come with economic instability, union leadership believes that school board trustees should also receive some form of transparent compensation, transparent compensation, to further justify and provide them the time and resources sacrificed when they perform their duties with diligence and competence. Although many in the community would be proud to apply their expertise to these matters of CUSD, not all have such an abundance of time and resources to provide these at no cost to themselves. Like yours, there are many community members with good hearts out there, and union leadership believes many of these people could bring much needed diversity to the CUSD school board. Therefore, we ask the school board to place the topic of board remuneration on the upcoming or an upcoming school board agenda. And then, of course, union leadership continues to encourage the school board to place on the agenda an examination of the benefits and the costs associated with prohibiting CUSD school board members from directly participating in the district's collective bargaining discussions. We do not believe this serves the district or the variety of parties impacted by our collective bargaining discussions. And we believe that you would benefit as well as the students the employees in the community, if each one of you had a better idea of what was happening in that room versus whatever you're told by the district's team. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and adjourn us for the evening. Thank you.
two 